Hi everybody, I hope you're well. Today I will read from a book titled Forays Beyond the Modern, The Architecture of Umberto Riva, edited by Maria Bottero and published by Cosa Mentale. Maria Bottero wrote, Many voices can be heard in this book, those of the editor, the artist, the critics. In the foreword to the anthology in the role of editor, I introduce the professional as the existential figure of the artist, the thinking of the artist, and the thoughts of critics on the artist, including those of myself, who in essence take the stage with me, anticipating the contributions of the anthology. The anthology is a collection of reprints of the opinions of critics from 1989 to 2015. In the afterword to the anthology as editor, acquainted with the texts of the artist and the critics, I present my own ideas of the artist's work, which in my view goes beyond the epistemological parameters of modernity. Thus, the discourses of the editor, the artist and the critics lie on different planes of time, but intersect on the theme proposed, which is that of a critical reappraisal of the architecture of Umberto Riva from the perspective of the present. Self-Portrait of an Artist from Interviews, 1970-2011 I am not able to separate the architect and the civilized person, so I have just one attitude towards things that grip me completely. For me, practicing architecture is a global attitude of understanding. I don't work as a professional. I have no eloquence and so I am only able to establish relations with people through architecture, that is, through doing things a certain way of doing things. Architecture is the only real way in which I am able to communicate. I never thought of becoming an architect and not even of getting a degree. There was a generation, that of the war and the post-war period, which carried fear and confusion in its head and as a consequence was unable to make plans. It has all been accidental. I wanted to be a painter because I was able to draw and it seemed to me that that was the thing best suited to my manner of staying on the fringes, the one that requires fewest institutionalized attitudes. However, family circumstances led me to enroll to study architecture and then I took a really long time to graduate. From there I started over and at the same time perhaps unwittingly, took the road, thought was at times, of the freedom of a personal research, remote from the necessary disciplinary endorsements. I am someone who tries to turn the profession of architect into a means of communication with others. Outside architecture, I am an extremely inconstant person, lacking a position. For me, architecture is a neurosis, a sickness. It's a bit like those mad people who paint, whom they get to paint because they find an equilibrium in painting. That's why I'm an architect. It's my way of giving myself back the equilibrium that external events take away from me. So for me, architecture makes sense only as therapy. I wasn't much bothered about getting noticed. It is no accident that a certain kind of recognition was fairly late in arriving. If you don't publish, no one knows who you are. If they don't know you, they don't call you. The real reason why I went back to painting was that, as an architect, I had virtually no work. Or maybe I should say, in the 1970s, I did not recognize myself in the role of a professional architect. So I thought painting might be in some measure a substitute. I rediscovered in painting all kinds of comforts and defenses. It was work, but work that I did not have to account for to anybody. And it was something I would eventually have submitted to the judgment of the market. Later, however, it became possible again to work as an architect. So painting remained a fragmentary pursuit. 
Unlike architecture, painting has no a priorities. It is a direct business. My way of designing architecture starts out from the assumption that all the parts should have an identity of their own. They should all come into play and therefore be to some extent necessary. The very big that is enhanced by the very small and vice versa. The positive that reinforces the negative. The same thing happens in painting. When I paint, I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. I just create something like structures, for example in Indian ink. And then the real work is that of taking all the elements into consideration and seeing to it that a web of complicity and necessity is created between them. No element is abandoned, left unexplored or unexpressed. Only at the end do I feel responsible for my choices. Or rather, only at the end do I take the risk of closing the circle again. Having said that, in painting as in architecture, I always start from the center of the composition and move towards uh, the outer edge, the border, and then begin to come back again. I am not in favor of a mental kind of painting, just as I am not in favor of a mental architecture. I am for an architecture of things, of a very physical kind, and for a painting with plenty of color and a lot of form. So, you see, I'm absolutely not somebody who sublimates. I have worked as an architect, but, as I told you, I could also have been a painter or a stage designer. The only important thing was, and is, to be able to express oneself through forms. I steal ideas and then maybe make use of them till they light up. The E63 lamp, the first one I designed, is thus a precise homage to Brancusi, whose work I have loved. And the furniture too. The furniture in my architecture is always a signpost, a formal element that somehow comments on or backs up certain design decisions. My first true passion was Macintosh, Amperet, then Asplund, architects in whose work the figurative component is important. This is not radical architecture. Coming from a secondary school specializing in the arts, I found in their formal richness an approach that led to an understanding of what architecture could have been. When you go to university, it is not easy to grasp how an institution is structured or how it functions. Having the support of forms that I felt to be in some way an inspiration meant that before arriving at the radical works of the architecture of the 20th century, I found in these architects a feeling of how to tackle design. When all is said and done, Le Corbusier still gives me a lot. A bit like a great natural landscape, supposing that I am still capable today of interpreting a landscape. Le Corbusier is so generous in his images, so unpredictable. Every time he presents the established facts to you in a different light, with such brilliance that in the end he makes them seem obvious, as if they could not be any other way. I am always struck, for example, by his ability to be economical with space. Scarpa is undoubtedly the architect who has left the deepest mark on me. Scarpa's lesson, which has always fascinated me, is his ability to propose each time a material, a solution, in a surprising and unusual manner. What I like is not so much his excess of virtuosity as the intelligence with which he never takes anything for granted. Scarpa is someone who works beyond architecture, an artist, in the sense that he went through an experience that was total every time he tackled something. When I arrived in Venice I was not familiar with Scarpa, but I was really shocked by his skill and freedom in the use of materials. 
I came from the Milanese school, so aseptic and stylish, so socially selective, where it seemed that contemporary architecture belonged to an elitist world. And instead, the entrance booths of the Gallerie dell'Accademia, which harked back uh, to the architecture of the secession, suddenly gave new force and freedom to a whole series of materials that had been stigmatized and were no longer used. Everyone looks for putative fathers. I remember that I was fascinated by Le Corbusier, who was also a sculptor and painter, and as a consequence I found legitimations in his architecture, which was more severe, more moralistic. Scarpa is an experience that came afterwards. I do not possess the intellectual abstraction that would allow me to make judgments that go beyond my experience. I understand things only through experience. Work is also a great alibi. It is a way of legitimizing your existence, not just survival. It gives you a meaning in time. My work never has a theoretical underpinning. I have always been very experimental. I'm not someone who has certainties, nor who looks for them. I proceed by continual approximations. Error is the backbone of my method of proceeding. I take it for granted. There is always an element of risk in the profession for those who, like me, work by intuition. The book was designed in Paris by Spassky Fischer and printed in Belgium by Cassocrom. Ask for it at your local bookstore. Thank you for joining me today and see you in the next video.